the blizzard of 77. Anybody who lived in Southern Ontario or Western New York in the 1970s remembers the great blizzard of 1977. Uh, the Lake Erie had frozen over by December 14 of that year. The weather was much colder than usual. And as a result, the lake effect snow, which normally the winds carry in and jump in inches over a longer period of time, accumulated on the surface of Lake Erie. And uh, that particular storm hit, I think, a Friday afternoon. I was traveling with two friends in my old 1969 Buick rear-wheel drive, of course, and we were heading from Grand Rapids, Michigan to our home in St. Catharines, Ontario. And we felt that most of the storm was behind us. We had driven through quite a bit of snow, and we made it to the city of Detroit, and we were coming in on Highway I-96 and came just to the split at Grand River Avenue when we realized the traffic had backed up all the way out that far from the city, all the way out to Grand River Avenue. And so at the last minute, we followed a big tractor trailer that was cutting in through the snowdrifts onto Grand River Avenue. And so we uh, worked our way through the city, rather the slow route, but uh, it was our only alternative. And uh, the alarms were going off. You could see people actually breaking into stores, stealing TVs and so on. We were going through a very rough part of uh, the city. And uh, it was quite eerie, actually. There was very little traffic. We were motoring through. I had a, a big engine in the car. Although it was real wheel drive, we were just kind of using uh, the force of the vehicle to plow through the snow. We felt by the time we got to uh, the border that the storm was pretty much past. We weren't listening much to the news, I'm afraid. We got across uh, the border. Uh, the bridge was quite dicey, and we finally made it across. And uh, we filled up our vehicle with gas, and we got something to eat. And we started looking for a motel. We'd called home and told them, look, we're going to stay here overnight. Uh, the weather's quite poor. And, and so they, they all went to bed nicely thinking we were, we were going to do that. But we were young and a bit foolish, of course. And um, we started looking around for a motel room. Nothing. Everything was packed. And uh, we went into one um, hotel and and I said, well, you know, what about us just kind of lying down here? Sorry, all the spots in the rotunda were taken. Even people were sleeping in the bathrooms. And so we thought, well, we're through the worst of it. Let's give it a try. And so we got out in the car and we drove about five miles out of the city of Windsor. And we were just coming to the point where the uh, access road swung around onto the 401 highway when we had to go under this overpass and as we came around the curve we realized people who had been trying to get into the city of Windsor and the road was blocked with cars as far as the eye could see on the incoming road they had somehow crossed over and were coming in on the outbound road, and we came around the curve. We'd been blinded by this big bridge. We came around the curve, and here were vehicles coming towards us on the access road. And so we slammed on our brakes, and just at that point, the, the big Buick sort of slid up onto the top of a drift. Now, this snow was extremely hard-packed because it had been a powder snow sitting on the surface of Lake Erie, and the high winds, 40, 50 mile an hour winds, had blown that snow up, and it was being packed in. In fact, later on, they couldn't even use the snow plows to push the snow out of the way. They had to use front end loaders and construction equipment to dig this snow out. The blizzard of 77, we read, 
was from January 28 to February 1. And the report says daily peak wind gusts range from 46 to 69 miles per hour. That's 74 to 111 kilometers an hour. And with snow drifts as high as 100 inches recorded in areas. And the high winds blew these into drifts of 30 to 40 feet. I remember seeing a picture of an individual um, uh, in upstate New York. And uh, the military had come in and used uh, trenching machines to actually slowly dig their way to this house. And it was covering the third story of that house. And uh, the fellow said, well, at least there's no wind whipping it under the front door anymore. But uh, there were lots of stories of the police. Of course, in those days, the only way they could get around was basically snowmobiles. One um, police officer on a snowmobile, uh, she hit something and flipped over and went back to see what it was. And she had hit the roof of a car that was sitting on a car carrier on a transport. That's how deep the snow was. Astronomical. Everybody remembers the snow of 77. Uh, but let me just quote a verse to you and then tell you a little story. Philippians 2, 4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. There we were, stuck in this uh, drift, and we made sure our windows were down a little bit because we had to leave the engine running all night long. And thankfully, we had just got a full load of gasoline on board. And we tried, as the snow drifted up, we would have to push the doors open. And we actually had the hubcaps. We popped off a couple of hubcaps. That's all we had to dig with. And we were digging away the snow because the snow would have gone right over the roof of the car. We had to keep getting out and digging the snow around the car. And eventually, it was just snow packed right up under the car. And we had to dig away at the exhaust, constantly digging that away. We'd get out. I mean, we're talking 40, 50 mile an hour winds. In the city of Buffalo, two police officers would go out and rescue a person and drag them into buildings because the wind was just blowing them right over. And so um, we, we had to keep digging away at the doors and digging away at the rear end of the car so that, that we could keep the engine running. Well, there was a little fellow in a in a little Mazda, and he had been coming in the wrong way, and he had tried to get by, and he got stuck, of course. And uh, so every once in a while, in the earlier stages of the night, snowplows might come along trying to keep that one lane open that was actually the outbound lane, but people were trying, still trying to get in. And uh, eventually, our whole section was just all plugged. And there was a great big motor home that had tried to get around us and ended up getting stuck in a drift not far from us. And this little fellow, every time a, a snowplow came along, he would jump out of his car, he'd run over and plead with the people, you know, to clear away the little section in front of his car so he could get free. And when uh, they'd say, look, sorry, buddy, we're too busy right now. And he'd say, well, just me, just me. We just need a little section of the road cleared uh, out to the, that lane, and we would be free to travel a bit. So he would say, just me, just me. And then, that, of course, they were too busy, and away they'd go. Well, uh, after a while, his gasoline was running out. And so he came over and asked if he could get in our car with us to keep, keep warm. And uh, so we allowed him to do that. And, and once again, he followed this practice. A snowplow would come along, he'd jump out, run over, and, uh, and say, no, 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 just me, just the little red car, just me, you know. And then when they'd say no, he'd get back in the car and he'd, he'd object in these strong terms about how selfish the snowplow driver was, that he was only thinking about himself and he wasn't prepared to dig this little car out. And so this carried on through the evening. This fellow kept expressing his his uh, disdain at all these snowplow drivers that wouldn't come and help him. And yet he had absolutely no interest in helping us. Well, the police came by about maybe two or three in the morning, made sure we didn't have any children or old people in the car. And we said, no, we're fine. And we, we just uh, stuck it out through the night. 
bitterly cold and uh, we were just barely able to keep the heat at our feet. Uh, the rest of the car was chilly. We were, of course, dressed up in our coats and, and tried to keep warm. So we tried to share the gospel with this fellow. He was just wrapped up in himself, totally wrapped up in himself. Well, eventually when morning came, uh, the, the fellow that owned the big motor home had somehow probably paid a huge amount of money and found a tow truck that was willing to pull him out. And in order to do that, he had to get some uh, snowplow help and they wanted to get this motor home out of the way because he was really blocking the road. And so uh, we got out of our vehicles and we went over to try and help. There were two or three cars in the way and so we helped push those cars out of the way. And uh, the little guy was just sitting in our car staying warm. He didn't come out to help. Uh, well, finally, they got this big, they wanted to get this motor home out of the way, but our car was kind of in the way. This little red car was off to the side. And so the fellow uh, came and, and said, look, we're going to have to move your car out of the way too. And so he hooked up his uh, tow truck and pulled us out onto the road so that he could get that motor home out. And uh, the, the little fellow, the last we saw of him as we pulled onto the highway, it was still real dicey. And uh, we were gonna drive towards Southern Ontario to the Niagara Peninsula. And for 60 miles, there were cars, bumper to bumper, as far as the eye could see, jammed up on that highway, just dead stop, nowhere to go. And, um, we, we stopped, we pulled in at uh, the first service area, and it was just bedlam. People sleeping on the floor, everywhere you looked, in the bathrooms, you name it. You could hardly uh, tiptoe around people in order to get anything done. And in the restaurant, there was a police officer sitting there having a coffee. And I said, uh, it doesn't seem like the service is uh, working. And he said, no, nope, just go up and grab what you want. Uh, make yourself a breakfast and uh, and then pay the lady some money on the way out. <laughs> and so it's kind of a self-service in the place. And uh, it was quite a remarkable evening. But here's this little guy and uh, he wants to get his little car out. And as we're pulled out onto the highway, he's sitting in his little car. He gets out and he says, hey, come on, me next. And the fellow said, sorry, we're, we're getting this motor home out and then we're gone. And the last we could see him was this little fellow jumping up and down in the snowdrifts, uh, screaming, uh, nobody cares about me, you know. He was just such a little caricature of the, the attitude of people who are just wrapped up in their own world and their own desires. Uh, they say a man wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. This principle that we shouldn't just look on our own interests, but also on the interests of others, has lost favor in the world. It's a doggy dog world. You got to look after yourself, you know, take care of number one, all this sort of a thing. Um, the Lord says, no, here's what I want you to do. You look after the interests of others and I'll look after your interests, right? If you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. The Lord says, I take it as an outstanding loan and I'll make sure and compensate you. Not necessarily in the same currency, but I will compensate you for your sacrificial life. And so this beautiful secret that the Lord gives us, that the way to be enriched is not to accumulate things, but to learn to give, and that in giving we are enriched. And so the scripture says, there is that withholds and it tends to poverty. There is that scatters and yet increases. So the farmer who would keep his grain in the barn would end up being impoverished. He takes it and he scatters it purposefully, wisely. He doesn't put it out on the expressway. He puts it in the field, in the plowed field. And what do you know, before long, he gets more grain. By throwing it away, so to speak, he gets it back. And that's the principle that we're sowing into the lives of other people, the generosity of God. And in the end, they become a harvest to us. And we receive a spiritual enrichment by not by taking up things, but by giving up things. May the Lord help us to renew in our own hearts this principle, uh, exemplified in the Lord Jesus, who didn't think about himself, who sacrificed himself and enriched the whole world by his 
sacrifice. So this is a great secret, this little story, little reminder. The Lord brought us finally safely home. Our family were blithely unaware of, of our situation, and they slept well through the night, and uh, we had some good fellowship uh, singing and uh, talking about spiritual things. We didn't sleep at all. We had to keep digging away the snow so that we could uh, not be suffocated in the car. But in that all, the blizzard of 77, nobody forgets it. Why, even some bands made songs about the blizzard of 77. It was such a big deal. So a little story, little reminder, uh, what a wonderful thing it is to learn to get outside of yourself and to minister to those around us uh, for the glory of God. Uh, not for our own advancement, but for the glory of God. But in the end, God honors those who honor this principle of self-sacrifice. <laughs>